right, welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris, and today I'm joined with Dr. Helen Taylor from here in New Zealand. Hello, Helen. Hi, Chris. Nice to be here. Thank you so much. It's We're so lucky to have you. It's I've been really wanting to do this interview for a long time now, and that's really to talk about your work with kiwi, kiwi birds. Yep. Yep, not yeah. the fruit. <laughs> no, not the fruit. <laughs> it's yeah. always important to specify. <laughs> yes, especially here in New Zealand. Yep. So, yes. It's... Uh, it's exciting to have you, and today we're just going to kind of get into your research and what, what you're doing now, too, which is still working with a lot of the, the native birds here in New Zealand. Uh-huh. If you could just, for the listeners, you know, I always like to, to get your background, uh, you know, where you grew up, where you're currently living, what you're currently doing. Yeah, no worries. So I'm originally from the UK, as you can probably hear from my voice, and I've been in New Zealand for the past seven and a half years. So I came out here to do my PhD um, and I've kind of been here ever since. Uh, but I grew up in various places in the UK. Uh, I've always had a big interest in, in natural history, which developed into an interest in conservation. But I had a bit of a funny career path where I did an undergrad in zoology. And then I went and worked in public relations for six years because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then I went back to university and did a master's. And I did a sabbatical in the Amazon for a bit just to check out whether I like field work. And then I came to New Zealand to do my PhD. So it's been a bit of a, a weird sort of circuitous journey for me. Yeah. And then right now you're at the University of Otago? That's right. So I live in Dunedin, which is down the very uh, south of New Zealand. I did my PhD at Vic University in Wellington and then moved down to Otago when I when I finished. It's cold down there, isn't it? <laughs> it can be. It can be. It's not as bad as everybody thinks, though, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like you're near Antarctica. Is, yeah, you're getting could, close. Yeah. yeah. There's yes, not a lot yes, between yes. us and Antarctica. Yeah. So you said you did stuff in the Amazon. Can you kind of talk about what you did there? Yeah, I spent uh, four months working in the Tambapata Reserve on a project called Proyecto Wakamayo, which is run by a guy called Don Brightsmith, who is at mm-hmm. Duke University in the States. And it's a project that's been going on for many, many years, um, where they monitor large macaws and parrots that are living in that part of the Amazon. They do a lot of work with artificial nest boxes. There's a big play lick there that the macaws use. Um, there's uh, work on transects and feeding studies, all kinds of stuff to do with these these birds, some of which are, are quite threatened in various areas of their range. So that was just, I wanted to see if I could cut it as a field biologist. And I thought, well, if I can, if I can manage in the Amazon, I should be able to manage pretty much anywhere. So it was kind of a test for me to, to go out there. And I loved it. I had a blast. It was fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, doing field work in New Zealand. It's like, for, you know, we, people pay a ton of money to come here to camp and, you know, look at wildlife. So going to the Amazon, yeah, it's just probably one of the harder places on earth to be out in the field, uh, you know. Yeah, I've been super fortunate. I mean, I get to go to amazing places in New Zealand as well, where most people who visit wouldn't get to go. So mm-hmm. some pretty remote island sites and things like that. Yeah. So I'm I'm actually really, really fortunate in the work that I do with the places that I get to, to see and, and visit. All right. Did you have, I actually have an interview that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Did you ever get to the Antipodes? Did you get to go out no, there? No, I would really okay. like to though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know there's a ton of islands, but he... He did the, uh, I don't know, I give too much to the listeners, but it's, it's a great interview we got coming up and went and did that part of that project, eradication project. So I'll, I'll oh, say, oh, cool, I'll say, cool. The, yeah. the Operation Mouse project. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Like to, to listen to him in that trip. So really quick, I mean, I, I we're going to get to the Kiwi in a minute, mm-hmm. the Kiwi birds, the Amazon. So it, it's, it's, it's a theme on our, podcast we talk a lot about you know the effects of the amazon what did you see there as far as you know maybe effects on bird population i don't know if that's something you can talk about or feel comfortable talking about uh yeah so what's what's really interesting to me is it's quite a long time since i went there now i think i I went Mm -hmm. in 2008 so we're talking about 10 years ago and Mm -hmm. i recently saw a video about the um the town near to where i was what i was working so there's a town called puerto maldonado um that's really close to the tambapata nature reserve and it's like the entry point for that part of the amazon And when I was there, that was a reasonably small town with mainly dirt roads and things running through it. And there was quite a lot of people there, but it was still quite a quite a jungle town. And now there's been a major highway um, built through that town. That's a major trade route for various countries. And there's a huge bridge been put over the Amazon. And I saw the video of this this place and I was like, oh, my God, I don't recognize it at all. 
And I, I don't know about the data of, of what kind of impacts that's having on that region and that national mm-hmm. park. Um, but I can only imagine that it is negative, although obviously it's really important for the livelihoods of the people who are living there. And it's probably improved their quality of life in terms of what it's doing to the surrounding forest. I'm, I, I would guess it's, it's less than ideal. Right, right. I mean, there's just so many pressures down there. You know, we, we cover some species down there. We, so we did do uh, on the harpy eagle down there and, and their struggles. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing, amazing place. Now you said your, your interest in conservation began as a, as a kid. So when you went to college, was that like, this is what I want to be doing or. It's yeah. Like, I mean, oh, I, yeah, it's, my it, love. Yeah. it's kind of a classic, like I watched a lot of David Amber as a child. And mm. so I was just like that. I want to do that. I want to be where those animals are. And I want to be seeing that stuff. And that's all incredible for me. I think, I think Sir David probably inspired an awful lot of people of my generation to pursue this kind of career. And so, yeah, I went to university at 18 thinking, you know, this is this is what I want to be doing. And I really enjoyed my time studying that stuff, but then just kind of was a little lost at the end. Didn't didn't really know what I wanted to do. And so got a job and and, and sort of, you know, lost myself for a wee while there and then realized I didn't like that job and decided to find my way back to conservation. But that experience. So it's just amazing. Sorry life, you know, is just a journey. And I reading some of your work and your interest, that public relations job has given you insight into science communication, right? I mean, yeah, that's definitely. One of your big things. Yeah. Yeah. I used to worry that it had been a bit of a waste of my time. You know, I spent six years working in public relations. Um, but actually, I've, I've realized over the past few years that I picked up an awful lot of skills when I was working in that career that have served me really, really well in, in my scientific career as well. So yeah, communication, the ability to write well, the ability to break down complex ideas and, and, and simplify them for a general audience, like all of those things are super important. Oh, they are. And you have an amazing website. So I'll, I'll definitely make sure the listeners have the link to that. Cool. It's, it's really great. You know, some of the stuff, the education resources I've been pouring through and, you know, the work that you're doing, it's just, it's, it's really great. And as a, as a fellow scientist and ex researcher, I can appreciate the difficulty in trying to communicate some of these complex ideas to people that don't understand it. So that, yeah, it's amazing. That's really great. That's really great. So. What are you doing? I guess, where did your research or your interest in in the kiwi and I guess specifically the little spotted kiwi begin? Mm -hmm. So it kind of came out of nowhere. I was I was finishing up my master's degree in Manchester in the UK. And I was kind of trying to think about what I wanted to do next. And I talked to my professors there about maybe doing a PhD. And we weren't really sure. And then uh, this PhD working on little spotted kiwi was advertised. And I didn't know anything about the species or, or kiwi in general. At that point, I didn't even know there was more than one species of kiwi. And of mm-hmm. course, now I know that there are five. Um, and what was interesting to me, not so much the bird, like obviously the bird is very cool and it's a very unusual group of birds, um, but the questions that could be asked there. So I just started to understand the the kind of the role that genetics could play in conservation and where it could be quite important. And it just struck me that this was a really interesting study system for, for looking at, at some of the issues that threatened species face when it comes to things like small population sizes and losses mm-hmm. of genetic diversity and um, inbreeding, mating between relatives, that kind of thing. I mean, this is a species, little spotted kiwi went down to just five individuals just over 100 years ago. So in terms of like extreme conservation stories, it's it's mm-hmm. it's up there. And so there were some really interesting questions that could be asked in, in that species. And it just seemed like a really cool opportunity. So having never been to New Zealand before in my life, I applied for the PhD. And to my surprise, I was I was accepted for the program. And, and I moved out here a couple of months later. Yeah, here you are. Here you are. No, it's mm-hmm. it's amazing. Yeah, it for the listeners that that haven't had a chance to listen to the Kiwi episode, the like like Dr. Taylor said, they were down to five five birds, right? And then they they were on one island, right? That the story about them. Yeah, so little spotted kiwi. So they're the so like I said, we have five species of kiwi here in New Zealand, and little spots are the smallest and the second rarest species. So they're about the size of a of a chicken, basically, um, and they're kind of grey and fluffy. They're the fluffiest, I think, the cutest of the kiwi species, <laughs> and they have this really interesting history where they used to be widespread throughout New Zealand. And about a hundred years ago, someone took five birds from somewhere in the South Island, we're not sure where, and put them on an island called Kapiti Island, which is really near to Wellington. 
Britain, New Zealand's capital city. And um, those birds survived and reproduced and the population on Kapiti Island grew. But meanwhile, the whole mainland population were extirpated um, because of introduced mammalian predators. And so all that was left was these birds on Kapiti Island. But because there were then by that point about, you know, 1000 birds on Kapiti Island, the Department of Conservation was able to take some of those birds and put them on other islands to make new populations. So today we have about 1200 to 1500 little spotted kiwi in New Zealand, but they're all descended from those five birds that were moved to Kapiti Island just over 100 years ago. Right. And it's, you know, they're there are species out there like we we did an episode on Przewalski horse so mm-hmm. they, their their breeding population was down to 12 yeah. we did black-footed ferret i think it was their yep. breeding population was 17 right so yep. these you know we do talk a lot about you know getting down to these critical numbers right now one of the the most endangered mammals on earth is the vaquita porpoise in the yes. gulf of mexico so you know you get these tiny populations. So from your perspective as a scientist, what are the long-term effects on inbreeding? So it can be a really long-term process in breeding, especially when you've got a long-lived species. So kiwi can live from 30 to 80 years in the wild. That's their estimated life expectancy. So these are birds that live a very long time and get very old and they can keep reproducing for a lot of that time. So what one of the main findings of our research was that you may have inbreeding happening and it may be causing problems in terms of reproduction, hatching success, recruitment back into the adult population, but you might not start to see the negative effects of that inbreeding for many, many years because the uh, the, the earlier generations that are kind of doing okay are going to survive and keep reproducing um, this whole time. Um, and that's masking any, any issues that might be happening with later generations. So for a species like kiwi, you could have these problems happening and it could take a really long time to see them. And if you were just looking at the numbers at the population growth and things like that, you might think that the population is fine. And that's actually what's happened for little spotted kiwi. They were Mm -hmm. downgraded by the IUCN from vulnerable to near threatened based on their population growth. Um, But what we now know is in in at least one population um, that we studied, um, they are having significant inbreeding depression, um, but that is being masked by the success of the founding, the older founding birds in that population. So it's a bit of a complicated picture for these long-lived species, and we we need more than just census data to understand what's happening with them. Population growth is not really enough to measure it. Right. So there, you know, some of the things we talk about, and we try to explain, you know, inbreeding depression, things like that to our listeners, the, you know, a disease can come and wipe out the whole population almost, right? I mean, they're, they're pretty susceptible to just something simple like that. Yeah, so that's to do with, you know, when you lose genetic diversity, when a population gets very, very small, you're going to lose genetic diversity just due to chance. And so if there was um, a, a gene for resistance against a particular disease and that's been lost and no bird in your population has that disease resistance gene and that disease hits your population, then, yeah, you're in serious trouble. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, because your population is small, there's not a lot of choice um, in terms of who to mate with. So you end up with a lot of mating between brothers and sisters and cousins and aunts and uncles and all kinds of things. And that in turn acts to continue to reduce genetic diversity, but also um, causes what we call inbreeding depression, which is where because of mating between relatives, harmful traits such as poor fertility poor hatching success, poor survival become more and more prevalent in the population because versions of genes that wouldn't normally get expressed in that population are being expressed because of mating between relatives. It is. I mean, and I can imagine the the opportunity to study that for you is just like, wow. I mean, there's there's very few ma- you know, species on earth, not just mammals, but just birds and anything that was so reduced to such a tiny population and then have rebounded, like you said, number wise, but looking at the overall health of the population, you would say there's still pretty extreme risk of extinction, right? Yeah, I mean, little spotted kiwi have the lowest genetic diversity of any of the five kiwi species we have here. And they also have some of the lowest genetic diversity of any species of bird in New Zealand, which is saying something because birds in New Zealand in general have really low genetic diversity because a lot of them have been reduced to really small population sizes. So they really are in terms of their genetic health. It's it's not a very pretty picture. Yeah, yeah, it, it isn't. So what would you, you know, could you describe some of the threats, I guess? And, and I've, you know, alluded to it in the podcast, you know, multiple times about, you know, some of the things that could be threatening them. What are, I guess, in your opinion, are some of the major threats to, to Kiwi on, on the mainland, you know, where they're at? 
Yeah, so the, the two major threats to kiwi in New Zealand are basically the same threats that most native species in New Zealand face. And the first is habitat destruction and habitat fragmentation. So New Zealand used to be mainly forested, uh, but when people arrived, um, they started cutting down forests to turn it into agricultural land and all and to use wood for houses and that kind of stuff. Um, and at the same time, when people arrived in New Zealand, they brought with them mammals. So New Zealand didn't used to have any mammals at all. It had two bats. Um, and, and they weren't really causing anyone any problems. So all of the birds and insects and lizards in New Zealand evolved completely in the absence of mammals. They are not evolved to run away from predators like mammals. They're, they're not evolved to deal with them at all. And then when humans arrived, they, they brought in rats, stoats, possums, cats, dogs, a whole host of uh, hedgehogs as well, a whole host of mammalian predators um, that just ran through New Zealand's native fauna and, and really kind of decimated those populations. So those are the two main threats for kiwi, habitat destruction and introduced mammalian predators. All right. And I don't know if you feel comfortable talking about it because I know it's not like what you're researching, but I have some friends that work with DOC, uh, Department of Conservation here in New Zealand, and dealing with it's somewhat controversial on trying to reduce those mammal populations. And I know the, the government wants to, by 2050, right, have a whole handle on this. Yeah, predator-free New Zealand. Right. Yeah. Do, do you think, I mean, from your perspective and the, the, from what you're hearing, uh, how successful are, are they with that? So I think predator-free 2050 is a really important goal. I think it's very important that the government started talking about this issue and putting some funding behind it. Um, New Zealand is a world leader in eradicating mammalian species from places where they're not supposed to be is something that the Department of Conservation has been working extremely hard on in New Zealand for, for many, many years. Um, but there is a recognition that in order to reach a predator free target, we need um, bigger and better technologies to do it other than the, the trapping and the toxins that we currently use. So I think what's nice about Predator Free 2050 is that it's produced some funding that can go into research to um, produce better technologies, uh, more effective technologies for predator eradication. Um, whether or not we actually have a predator free mainland by 2050, well, we won't have a predator free mainland by yeah. 2050, I don't think, because predator free New Zealand targets rats, stoats, and possums, but those are not the only mammalian predator threats to New Zealand. So if you're just measuring it on a predator-free New Zealand 2050 target, that, that doesn't count. There's, what about mice? What about hedgehogs? Mm -hmm. And then there's very sensitive issues around cats and dogs because those are people's pets and companion animals. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit more of a complicated picture than that, but I do think that it's a really positive move in that it's, it's started a conversation around that and around how can we generate more effective technologies to, to, to rid vast areas of the mainland of these these problem species no absolutely absolutely i you know i can only imagine being in a, a researcher in your field and that is this is the place to be you know this is a a place where the government is supporting it and you know back in my home country in the united states where there's a lot of cut to funding and actually a lot of deregulation right now which is really scary for a lot of species so it's good to see that, you know, that's why New Zealand's again, amazing. I know we have issues here like everywhere, but yeah, it's amazing that they're putting money uh, behind that. Yeah. Now I, we didn't really get into the nuts and bolts of your, your PhD work with the Kiwi. And, and I do in a, in a minute want to get to what you're doing currently, uh, mm -hmm. the work you're doing now, but so where did you study them? I guess is the first question. Okay, so I had two study sites for Little Spotted Kiwi. The first was Zealandia, which is actually a, a, a sanctuary in, in Wellington, in, in New Zealand's capital city. So it's an amazing location. If you're ever in Wellington, you should definitely go visit Zealandia. Um, and it has um, a big predator-proof fence around it. So um, that stops any mammalian predators getting into the sanctuary so they can have a bunch of native birds there. So they have a population of Little Spotted Kiwi there um, of about 120 birds right next door to the capital city, which is just incredible to have this mm -hmm. amazing sort of sanctuary area so close to an urban area. Mm -hmm. uh, the other site was an island called Long Island, which is in the Marlborough Sounds. That's an area um, at the very top of New Zealand's South Island. Um, that it's it's kind of like lots and lots of little islands dotted about and peninsulas and things like that. And a lot of the islands have been cleared of mammalian predators. So they're, they're good places for birds. So Long Island is a predator free island. Um, that has uh, little spotted kiwi, kakariki, um, what else is on there? Uh, saddlebacks, 
South Island robins, a whole bunch of native bird species. So it's a really lovely place to work. And that, that population is really interesting because it was founded with just two little spotted kiwi that were taken oh, wow. from Kapiti Island in the 1980s. Um, and that population grew from two birds to 50 birds in about 30 years. So again, everybody assumed that it was fine, but we discovered that there were some serious problems there. Oh, I, from two? <laughs> That's yeah. like, just one big extended family. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's 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 really cool. So, how did you track them? Or, or how did you first find them and then track them after that? Yeah, so kiwi are really tricky, eh? Because they mm. um, they're nocturnal. Obviously, they're they're a cryptic species. They don't want to be found. They live in burrows underground, um, and it's really hard to find those burrows. So, when you're looking for kiwi initially, you have to go out with. Um, dogs, um, especially trained dogs and dog handlers who are uh, trained to track kiwi. And you go out and you find the birds. And then once you've found them, you can fit them with a radio telemetry tag. Um, and then what that means you can do is walk around with a big antenna and listen for the beep from the tag. And the louder the beep gets, the closer you are to the tag, and you can use that to locate the bird. And the tags that we used were actually pretty cool because they were preloaded with a piece of software called Chick Timer Software. It was the first time this software had been used in Little Spotted Kiwi. Mm -hmm. And what that software does is it tracks the activity of the bird. So as well as giving you the location of the bird, it also puts out a series of coded beeps. It's kind of like Morse code. And it tells you um, how many minutes the bird was active for the night before, what time did it leave the burrow or the nest, um, whether it looks like that bird might be incubating an egg based on its activity patterns, whether the egg is hatched. So you mm -hmm. can get a whole bunch of information about that bird's behavior without disturbing it too much, um, which was a really nice thing to be able to do. That is awesome. That is so awesome. I One of the things we do too on Friday is is we have a new show and it's, it's something we've started a couple months ago or you know, six or seven weeks ago and highlighting stories in conservation. And I'm, I'm amazed at how technology is having a major impact. Oh yeah. You know, it's incredible. There's some really cool stuff happening. Yeah. yeah that's, that, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, so this Island strategy that New Zealand has, I don't know if you can kind of explain it to listeners. If yeah. So, so what's happened in New Zealand a lot, what, what the Department of Conservation has been very, very good at being very proactive in the past where we had a bunch of species that had got down to really small numbers and they were very proactive in terms of scooping up those last remaining individuals and putting them on islands that had been cleared of mammalian predators. So these were used as sanctuary islands where these populations could then survive and reproduce and recover. Um, and that's been a really, really successful strategy up to now for New Zealand. Um, but the problem is, we're running out of islands, we're running out of space. So we've been very successful. We're growing up populations of, of, of these different species, but we really now need more space. And that means we need to be able to bring them back to the mainland, but obviously clearing the mainland of mammalian predators and, and finding habitat that's connected up and suitable for all these different species is a much bigger challenge. So I think that's, that's the kind of challenge that Predator Free 2050 is looking to address. And it really is the next big conservation challenge that, that New Zealand has to work around. You talk about Zealandia, and I know there's one up where I'm living, uh, sanctuary, a mountain sanctuary that they have. Mangatau tree, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that kind of the strategy that they're going with, or you know? So that is, that is one strategy. So you have a lot of these mainland island sanctuaries in in New Zealand. They're usually fenced with a large predator proof fence, which is actually really expensive to put up and maintain. Mm -hmm. um, and what you'll get with a lot of those sanctuaries, hopefully. Um, if especially if they're doing trapping around the the outskirts of the sanctuary as well, is you'll get a halo effect. So certainly, if you if you go to Wellington now, um, you will likely see Kaka, which is one of our native parrots, flying around the city. And the reason you'll see them is because there's been a really successful breeding population of Kaka in Zealandia that has then expanded outside the city. The same thing has happened with Tieke or saddlebacks that have been breeding in Zealandia and have now expanded to a trapped area outside of the sanctuary called Pole Hill Reserve, which has a really dedicated community team that looks after that area. And they're now starting to see saddlebacks nest outside of the sanctuary. So that halo effect with these fenced sanctuaries is really, really important. But for species like kiwi that can't fly, so they can't get over the fence, mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to make it out of the sanctuary, right? So mm -hmm. the, the kiwi that are in Zealandia stay in Zealandia. The kiwi um, that are in Orokanui here in, in Dunedin, they stay in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And so for those animals and for things like lizards and, and, and tuatara, which is a, a, a special reptile that we have here in New Zealand, mm -hmm. they can't expand beyond the sanctuary without human help. Right. Um, so sanctuaries are great for the birds that can get out and, and you can have this halo effect, but other other animals are going to need uh, a different strategy, really. 
No, it is. It, it's it. It is complex. You know, ecology is complex, and it, it's funny. It, it's it, before we get into what your current research is. There's there's a question I, I want to talk to you about. Uh, you know, humans messing with nature, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, we're really good at that. Yes. <laughs> And it's one thing I'm getting out of doing this podcast is just, you know, we, we talk about trickle up and trickle down effects on ecology. So when you start taking out major species, or any species, really, the, you know, you're going to have effects up and down the, uh, the web of life and the food, food web and all that stuff. So yeah, yeah, it's really, really complex. So speaking of, you know, humans messing with it. I know it's because Jurassic World's out in the theaters now. So Jurassic Park always <laughs> comes up every, you know, it's been out for 20 yep. years. The, you, you wrote a paper and, and I know before we start recording, I was really excited to talk to you about this. And your paper is de-extinction needs consultation. And it's, it's a theme that I've brought up in the podcast. And that's, you know, just talking about mammoth cloning and, and, and my feelings on mammoth cloning. For the listeners, can you just kind of sum up what that paper was? And by the way, it was in Nature, you know, Nature Letters. So I, I it was it was Nature and Ecology and Evolution. Just to be yeah. <laughs> just okay, to be clear, before still, we get too excited. <laughs> yeah, but it's still, you know, it, it was it, amazing, amazing uh, little paper you had in there. And so, can you just explain to the listeners what what you did, what you found? Yeah, so what we did for that paper, we were really interested to know, so there's, there's a lot of talk in the scientific literature about things like gene editing and de-extinction as tools for conservation and restoration. And most of the conversation around that comes from scientists and geneticists and people who are really excited about those technologies because they represent big leap forwards in the field. Um, but we were interested to get the opinions of actual conservation practitioners who are working on the ground and find out what they thought about these technologies. Because obviously, you know, if these technologies come to fruition, then these are the people who are going to be left managing the, the after effects of, yeah. of the implementation of these technologies. So it's really important to find out what they think. So we ran a survey of the Department of Conservation here in New Zealand, and we asked them, um, it was part of a larger survey, but relating to gene, ex gene editing and de-extinction, we asked four questions. Uh, very simple. Um, did they think that de-extinction was feasible within their lifetime? Um, did they think that de-extinction was a useful conservation tool? Was it something they were supportive of? And then we asked whether they were comfortable with gene editing for eradicating invasive mammalian species mm -hmm. and whether they were comfortable with gene editing for restoring genetic diversity to native species to look mm -hmm. at the, the contrasting attitudes to those different applications of the technology. And what we found was that the majority of people uh, didn't really think that de-extinction was feasible in their lifetime, mm -hmm. irrespective of how old they were. We did wonder if older people would be like, well, not in my lifetime, if yeah. maybe somebody else's. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, it was irrespective of yeah. age. Yeah, right. And um, that people were kind of divided. It was that slightly the majority um, were in, um, were against it as, as a restoration tool, but there were some really interesting um, arguments coming from people about, you know, some people were excited about it. Some people saw it as a poor diversion of, of resources. And then with the gene editing, it was really interesting because you had this real contrast of attitudes where people were, the majority of people were very comfortable with using gene editing for uh, eradicating invasive mammals, which is mm -hmm. something that we have a, a big conversation around in New Zealand at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but they were very uncomfortable with using it to uh, boost genetic diversity in native species. So people are quite happy to tinker around with things that are seen as invasive, mm -hmm. um, but not so much with, with their native, with their Tanga treasure species. Um, which is, is kind of understandable, but then it's also really interesting because obviously those species are native to somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, brush tail possums come from, from, from Australia, the stoats mm -hmm. come from Europe. Um, so it, we have these very polarized attitudes and the, the way these species have sort of been sold to people and portrayed to people in the media, you know, ma ma mammals in, in New Zealand are very much demonized, mm -hmm. um, perhaps necessarily to get people behind eradicating them, but it, it does cause this real polar, polarized attitude towards them versus natives. And I, and I could see where, you know, you have a small population and if you really start messing with the genetics, that's a little dicey. I don't know. And yeah, it is. But I mean, you know, a lot of people often ask me when I'm when I'm talking about the little spotted kiwi that has such low genetic diversity, mm -hmm. they're like, well, what can we do? And I'm yeah. like, well, at the moment, we can't really do anything. We we manage them as a meta population to try and ensure that we, we lose as little genetic diversity as possible. But mm -hmm. in the future... With gene editing technologies, there may be opportunities mm -hmm. to look at museum specimens of, of kiwi, mm -hmm. uh, see what genetic diversity was there before uh, 
um, the population really got very, very small and maybe try and reintroduce some of that genetic diversity. Um, that may be the only option for some of our species. And that was really interesting in our survey was the question we asked was, if you were given the choice between this species going extinct mm. and doing gene editing, what would you choose? And, you know, many people said, no, I still don't want to do the gene editing. So oh, wow. okay. there's a real interesting contrast there with what it's, it's what do you want to save? You know, if, if you're right. going to save it, do you want it to be saved as it is now? Or would you be happy with saving a slightly edited, genetically modified version of it? And, and I think that's a really important conversation. You know, we're, we're light years away from being able to mm. do that with native species, mm. but it, it will happen at some point that we have the technology available, I think. And so it's, it's important to start thinking about it and, and having that conversation. Uh, it's, uh, like I said, forward thinking. And it's hard for somebody, and, and I dabbled in genetics, so I didn't, you know, get full both feet on the, like you have done. So, you know, please correct me if I say anything wrong. It's just genetics are so complicated but the field has just advanced so quickly and I don't, you know, just, just somebody that isn't in the field of genetics, when you start talking about gene editing and now CRISPR, and isn't it the second generation of CRISPR already, which is the gene editing tool they're using. So yeah, it's, it's all about, it, it moves extremely quickly. And even, you know, not even talking about gene editing, but just talking about the tools that we use as conservation geneticists to measure genetic diversity in, in threatened species. You know, when I did my PhD, it was, it was one set of tools and now it's a whole new set of tools. And now we're moving to whole genome sequencing mm -hmm. for, for lots and lots of different wild species. So you really are constantly like running to catch up with, with everything that's happening in the, in the field. So it's, it is, it's extremely fast moving, which makes it very exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, but can also make it quite, quite challenging as well. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> You're studying like we study a lot to, you know, new species a week in, ge in genetics. You have to stay on top of it or you'll be outdated within a couple of years. It's just, yeah, pretty much. You can't publish your research anymore because you're, you're using an, an, an obsolete technology. Yeah. 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 I mean, I did a genetics paper and it was like, uh, this is old data. I'm like, I just finished this project, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. the gene expression. They're like, genex, no one looks at that anymore. You know, we're, we're doing, and, uh, you know, whole sequence genome, you know, and then when you go back to the human genome project, what it was like a billion dollars or something. And now, yeah. And now we're <laughs> in, in like a few years, we're going to be able to sequence the whole genome of, of an animal or a person for like a hundred or $200, right? It's getting yeah, so, so we, we yeah. regularly try and assemble genomes for, for wild species now, which yeah. is something that, you know, you wouldn't have been able to do a couple of decades ago. So yeah. it's, it's something that's really moving very fast. Yeah. It's, it's an exciting field. It's an exciting field. So, you know, de-extinction from your perspective as a scientist, and, and I've, talked about it with the listeners and you know the um oh out of harvard so the the scientists at harvard are mm -hmm. promoting hey we're gonna bring back the mammoth and yeah. you know something that I, I was always excited about and now i realize it it's not a good thing and they're promoting so you're you're a conservation geneticist so yeah. i would be remiss if i didn't talk about this for a little bit <laughs> They claim, and this is George Church, right? So yes, that's he's, right. Yeah, he's a big, big, big guy in in research. He says, yeah, he's gonna... a, he's a, an eminent genetic researcher. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. He's claiming they're going to bring back the mammoth and they're going to combat, reintroduce them to Siberia, so they can go and punch these big holes in the permafrost and mm -hmm. promote you know, or, or combat global warming. From your yeah, restore an important ecosystem function. Yeah, yes. that's what they want to do. Yeah. yeah, I understand elephant reproduction. I they're like you said, light years a, a away from doing any of this gene editing stuff. They're light years away from being able to bring back a sustainable herd, in my opinion. So, from yes. your from your perspective, you know, what is going on there? What is he talking about? Well, so I think that the first point to make is what George Church actually says and what the media spins that as mm -hmm. are two very different things. So mm -hmm. I, I think he often gets misrepresented because it is an exciting story and it, and it does, it sells newspapers and, it, and it's, it's good clickbait. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, when he says we've edited these genes into the elephant genome from a mammoth to make these particular elephant cells cold tolerant, mm -hmm. you know, then it's like, we're two years away from bringing back a mammoth yeah, and that's yeah. nonsense. And, yeah. and he never said that. So I think, you know, they, they are making really interesting advances, but you know, the other thing he's admitted is 
you know, it, it might be really difficult to get to grow um, a, a pseudo mammoth embryo mm-hmm. um, inside an elephant that he, you know, he may have to design an artificial uterus to, mm-hmm. to, to do this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's a whole other area of research that, that he needs to look into as well. So there's, there's many, many major things standing in the way. But I think the, the thing I have the biggest problem with in this whole discussion, and, and the reason I really don't like the term de-extinction, mm-hmm. is because it's extremely misleading. So mm-hmm. even if that lab or, or any other lab manages to do what they're saying they're going to do, they won't have brought back a mammoth, they mm-hmm. will have created a mammoth-like elephant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, we, with the best will in the world, we, we don't have complete genome sequences for mammoths um, or, or many other animals. We're always going to be filling in the gaps. So what you what you bring back is going to be sort of like a, a spliced half, you know, mammoth DNA with elephant DNA and all this kind of stuff in between. So it will be a hairy elephant that can deal with the cold and that might have slightly different ear shapes or bigger tusks or whatever Mm -hmm, but it it won't be a mammoth it might fill the same ecological niche as a mammoth Mm -hmm. but it won't be a true mammoth and so i I really object to the 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 rhetoric around this that that tells people that you're bringing back this species you you can't do that you can bring back an ecological proxy Mm -hmm. um of of that species Uh, but at the moment we're not able to 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 de-extinct things and obviously films like jurassic park can get people super carried away with this stuff and (laughs) it's 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 pretty irresponsible to to talk around this a lot and then my other take on this is whether we actually need to do this or or whether it would be better to take the funding that that gets directed towards this kind of research Mm -hmm. and use it to preserve species that are still here uh, that are still amongst us which desperately need funding and desperately need help and it, 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 I find it slightly upsetting that we're so quick to to pump resources into these kind of big so-called de-extinction projects mm. when we have so many species on the ground that are that are struggling. Amen. <laughs> we're done. <laughs> that's, anyway, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's just, that's, I, <laughs> I, I, I can't agree with you more. And that is the the road I've gone down the last decade is going from an idealistic researcher to oh we can do this, and if we look at these genes and you know trying to synchronize elephants and, you know, da, 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 then realizing, wait a minute, you know, African elephant every 15 minutes is killed. Their populations are crashing. Asian elephants are endangered. Why are we pumping millions and millions of dollars into a project that we could take that money and put it into African and, and Asian elephant reproductive research? Absolutely, and, absolutely. And think yeah. about the welfare of that first or first few uh-huh. so called mammoths that get brought back. You know, what what are they to be other than, you know, perhaps a curiosity in a mm-hmm. zoo or a lab or mm-hmm. and you know, there there are some serious welfare issues around that stuff that, that don't often get talked about as well. And then the genetic implications, right? So you're dealing with you know, five Kiwi to now we have 1200 plus. Mm-hmm. So if you start with one mammoth hybrid or elephant hybrid, and then yeah, you get another... yeah, there are some serious issues around you're you're creating a population bottleneck there because right. you know it's it's unlikely that you're going to be able to bring back a hundred mammoths that are super genetically diverse all at the same time. Right. Um, so you're going to have to manage the genetic diversity there extremely carefully. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with a species that has exactly the same problems as a lot of our other threatened species. Right. Right. Yeah. So okay. Okay. <laughs> we can move on. I just <laughs> I saw that I read that that paper and I just was like I've got to talk to you about this because it's just one of my hot burning topic issues that I just love to to discuss with other people. Fair enough. So what, from your standpoint right now with, I guess if you can talk about all Kiwi, but then just a little spot, what's their long-term prognosis look like from today in 2018? So it's really different between the species. So like I said, there's, there's five species. Um, their, their numbers range. So like Tokaweka, um, arguably is the healthiest population. Um, that's a South Island species of kiwi, uh, one of the larger species. There's 26,000 of those birds left mm. in New Zealand, but the population's declining. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, right at the other extreme, you have Roe. Um, which is another brown species that's found in the South Island, and it's the rarest species, and there's currently around 500 of those birds left. Mm-hmm. But the population's growing. The population mm-hmm. trend is the other way due to super intensive management. And the other three species are anywhere in between. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's really different for different species, and the challenges around working with those species are different as well. So 
uh, perhaps you know the most knowledge and understanding is 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 held for the North Island brown um, kiwi because they're found reasonably widespread across the North Island. They're found closer to urban centres, so people are more familiar with them and what they are. Mm -hmm. By contrast, you have a species like great spotted kiwi um, that's found in the South Island of New Zealand, but mainly in really mountainous areas. These are these are birds that get up and live up. But uh, above the snow line, right? Mm -hmm. So they're massive birds that live up in the mountains. They're really hard to work with. They're really hard to access and track. And so understanding what's going on with those birds is a whole other thing. And, and doing trapping for predators in those areas can be extremely challenging and time consuming just because of the, the habitat and the terrain that they're living in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, it, I mean, there is there are some excellent people and organizations working to, to conserve kiwi. You have uh, the Kiwi Recovery Group, which is sort of based within the Department of Conservation, but involves very talented scientists and practitioners from all over the country. And then you have Kiwis for Kiwi, mm -hmm. which is the charitable organization that does all the fundraising around kiwi conservation, who do some amazing work as well. So there's And, and then there's a, a really massive array of community groups and organizations who and, and, and sanctuaries and all kinds of things that are working to conserve the kiwi in their patch. So there's a huge amount of effort being put into this. Mm -hmm. um, and if it were based on effort alone, then I'd be like, yep, kiwi are going to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, they, they, they are really challenging species to work with. They're really expensive species to work with. You know, like each tag that I was putting on a, on a bird to, to track them was about $300 at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And you needed two per season per bird. Mm -hmm. So it, it, that's six hundred dollars just to track one bird and find out what's going on, which is is a fair whack of money when you start rolling that kind of technology out across a large population. So um, there's a there's a lot of stuff we still don't know about kiwi that it would be really good to know. Um, lots of stuff around their reproduction, you know, around just just good population estimates for certain populations we we don't know, and um, there's there's genetic stuff we don't know about them as well. So. It's um it's it's really hard to make a call on them. Mm -hmm. I I would like to think that there would be kiwi in New Zealand for the foreseeable future. Um, but, and there are big efforts to reverse the decline in the species that are declining. But it, they're they're a really challenging species to work with or set of species to work with. Right, right, yeah. No, well, thank you, and you know we'll keep uh, spreading the word on on kiwis and what uh, is going on with them because they're amazing i i got to see the brown kiwi at the uh, kiwi uh, conservation center which is about 45 minutes south of oh yeah where I'm at. Yep. yeah so uh first time i i mean they were always i i grew up in san diego so they had kiwi exhibit i never saw it yes they're one of the few zoos that actually have <laughs> kiwi yeah, yeah outside of new zealand i i grew up going to that zoo every time i walked in there i never saw one the first kiwi i saw or kiwi bird was at this this center. Oh, uh, really? South of, yeah, yeah. It was. I was so excited. And you can't take pictures in there, and I'm like, ah, you know, <laughs> this, this big uh, brown kiwi. So it was really, really amazing. So, oh, you need to get down to Zealandia and do a night tour because that's a that's a great opportunity, especially to see little spotted kiwi, which are really hard to see because they're usually on offshore islands. So right. Zealandia is probably the best place for that. I it, it is on the list. It is on. The, I got to get down to Wellington. <laughs> so can you tell the listeners what you're you're currently doing? So you you. You know, I know you, you probably still dabble in the kiwi a little bit, but what are some of the other species? I know you're you're doing sperm biology, which is yeah. Really so awesome. yeah. The, I'm still working on inbreeding, and I'm still working on what happens to populations when they get very small. Mm -hmm. But what I'm what I'm focusing on at the moment is what the effect of inbreeding is on male fertility in birds. Mm -hmm. So we know that inbreeding causes poor male fertility across a really wide range of species, uh, mammals, insects, plants. But this is something that hasn't really been looked at in great detail in birds. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I'm, I'm trying to find out if our threatened male birds in New Zealand are firing blanks. Mm -hmm. uh, are they having problems because of inbreeding? We know that we have really low hatching success in a lot of our bird species in New Zealand, mm -hmm. but we don't always know if that's to do with poor male fertility or poor development or poor parenting. Um, and so it's really important to try and sort of pick those things apart. Um, so I'm focusing on two of our native species, the South Island robin and the hihi or stitch bird, which is found just in the North Island. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find out what's going on with their sperm, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have any insight on what you found so far? Uh, so I'm still in the middle of collecting data. So I did a big field season last year with Hihi, where I spent the whole of October going across four different Hihi sites mm -hmm. and collecting sperm from 128 male birds. Mm -hmm. And I'm about to go out and uh, do a season with South Island Robins. that will start in August, September, going across six different sites for those guys and, and, and getting semen from as many birds as possible. Um, and so what, what we're expecting to see if if 
um, inbreeding is a problem for male fertility is that uh, more inbred birds will have sperm that swims slower, mm-hmm. um, that features more abnormalities, so like missing heads, missing tails, um, and that tends to be shorter because we, we generally agree that, that longer sperm um, do better, as a, mm-hmm. especially in birds. Um, so that, that's what we do. We, we measure sperm swimming speed and we have a look at the sperm when we get back to the lab under the microscope and, and measure the length of it and, and look for abnormalities and things like that. And then at the same time, we're taking blood samples from birds so that we can get DNA and have a look at the genetic diversity and, and inbreeding in those birds as well and see if the two are related. So how do you, how do you collect? I mean, I've done a lot of mammalian, so elephants and, yes. and livestock. How do you collect male birds? Uh, how do we catch the oh, birds? Well, I guess, yeah. I guess that's a two-part <laughs> in my head. I'm a reproductive physiologist, so it would be like, yeah, the, the, the people know what I'm talking about. How do you collect the males or how do you collect the semen from a bird? Okay, so um, so birds are really different um, from mammals in that most bird species, the males don't have a penis. They have an opening called a cloaca. Mm-hmm. And the cloaca is used for getting rid of waste. So it's a hole for poop and it's also a hole for reproduction. And so what happens to the area around the cloaca during the mating season in males, it gets very, very swollen and it produces this structure called a cloacal protuberance. And this is where semen is stored before mating. So we can use a non-invasive technique once we've caught the bird. Um, I sort of like hold him in a, a special grip and flip him over. And then I give the cloacal protuberance a very gentle massage. So a very, a very gentle squeeze side to side and back to front. And that just causes a little bit of semen to pool on the surface of the cloaca. And we can then draw that off um, with a capillary tube and pop it straight under the microscope in the field to video the sperm swimming around and measure their speed. What, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to get technical too much. What, what are you using in the field? What uh, what equipment? Because yeah, so it's really obviously it's really challenging yeah. um, to measure sperm swimming speed in the field because I go to a lot of offshore islands. We don't have ready sources of electricity. We have all this expensive gear that we have to protect, and also one of the major challenges is keeping the sperm at a con- constant temperature mm-hmm. um, because sperm, as I'm sure you know, are pretty high maintenance, and if they get too hot or too cold they die mm-hmm. and they're, they're not very good at swimming when they're dead mm-hmm. um so we have to look after all of that so we've designed um a special mobile sperm lab that we can take to all these different offshore island sites that we go to and it's basically um a big tall tent like a, a tent that you would use as a changing tent or a, or a toilet tent if you went camping mm-hmm. and inside of that we have this special setup where we've got a table with uh, a microscope and the microscope is connected to a camera. The camera is then connected to a laptop, which has a special piece of software on it um, that allows us to measure sperm swimming speed. And meanwhile, we have a box with a reptile heat pad in it um, inside a Tupperware box. It's a very sophisticated piece of equipment. <laughs> and yes. um, we use that to keep everything that's going to touch the sperm warm. Mm-hmm. So any kind of pipette tips, any tubes, anything like that all sits in this box to stay warm. And then we have a slide warmer on the microscope that keeps the sperm at a constant temperature. Mm-hmm. And I also have my most important piece of equipment is a special custom designed um, sperm tube holder that sits inside my sports bra. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so once we get the semen from the birds, we pop the tubes straight into the into the holder in my bra yeah. so that they stay against my skin and stay warm yep. until I can get them to the lab and, and pop them under the microscope. It, it's, yeah, I, I, it's funny because I just yeah I I I could just uh, have so many memories of like super cold mornings collecting males and just finding any way to keep that stuff you know keep the semen warm. So, Where did you put your semen? So uh, generally in a pocket in my shirt. So I had like probably a jacket yeah. and a and a vest, and so I just put it there or sometimes i just put it in my pocket like especially when we were breeding and breeding uh, mm-hmm. uh horses and stuff like that and then my i just told you my graduate student daniel arnold she's now dr daniel arnold and when she went and did rock hyrex they were not that s- as sophisticated as you i guess they had like a whole <laughs> building that they they had truckloads of equipment to to do the work they did down there in south africa so yeah that's that's awesome that's awesome so what's next for you? You just keep doing this and then are you going to hopefully stay in New Zealand and, and keep working and fighting the good fight? So I'm on a, I'm on a Marsden funded project mm-hmm. for the, for the bird sperm work and that funding lasts until the end of 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm a research fellow. I'm not a permanent member of staff at, at Otago. Mm-hmm. So once that contract's finished, I have to think about, okay, what, what am I going to do next? Well, before that contract finishes, actually, I'll have to think about what I'm going right, to do right, next. Right. Um, so then it's a case of, of where I can find work, mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. So it may be that I have to leave New Zealand mm-hmm. and, and go overseas to, to get work, or I may be able to stay depending on, 
what the opportunities are. But I think, you, you know, as a, an early career researcher in science in this day and age, you do have to be realistic that mm. you may not always have a choice mm. and you might have to be flexible about where you go because the opportunities, it, it's extremely competitive. Mm. The opportunities and the funding aren't always exactly where you want them to be. So sometimes you do have to be a little bit flexible about what you do. Yeah, but I mean, it's, I can just imagine some of the places you, you can, you know, that are going to be offered for you to go would be amazing. So, you know, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully we get to keep you in New Zealand because it's, it's an amazing, uh, the work you're doing uh, for these birds. And I know we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us uh, in trying to keep these populations viable. But I mean, the Amazon, New Zealand, you know, you're right there near Antarctica. You're, you're in some Ant- yeah, some- there's there's so many cool places that I would love to go as well. And so, yeah, there, there's there's all kinds of exciting opportunities. Yeah, yeah. And, and you just never know. I mean, if you'd asked me eight eight or nine years ago whether I would be, you know, collecting semen from birds on offshore islands, I'd have told you you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah. So, you're like, what? You know, like, who knows? Who knows what I'll be doing in the next few years? Yeah, always. Life, like I said, life's a journey and you never know where you're going to end up. Absolutely. Now, I, yeah, I know you're busy. It, it's it's one of the things I always like to ask, and this came up in a, I was in, I was, I have to explain this, I guess. I was in a, a meeting before I left the States with other, a bunch of other researchers. And we were talking about, you know, more, do we have a moral obligation to save endangered species? And one of the scientists that I really adore and look up to, and he said, we don't. And I stood up and said, well, we do. So mm-hmm. for somebody that's dedicated your, you, you know, your life and a lot of blood, sweat and tears the last few years doing this work, do we have a moral obligation to save endangered species? I feel like I do personally, like I feel like it's something that's very important to me and, and it always has been. And I feel like I wouldn't feel comfortable or I know I wouldn't feel mm-hmm. comfortable because I've, I've done it doing a job where I wasn't contributing to conservation. That's, that's something that I would like to feel that I would be doing for the rest of my life mm-hmm. um, in one way or another, depending on the job. But I also understand that it's not everybody's first priority and that there's, there are so many things in the world to care about and so many issues and so many problems. And I can completely understand why people get so overwhelmed with the amount of bad news Mm -hmm. and and issues that they're faced with on a daily basis. So I think as conservationists, it's very easy for us to sort of stand up and say, everybody should care about this thing Mm -hmm. that I care about. Meanwhile, someone doing humanitarian work in the Sudan or somewhere is like, well, why don't people care about my issue over here? Mm -hmm. And it's equally important to them. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yes, for me, conservation and the natural world is is something that I care deeply about and I, and I do feel obligated to help in any way I can. But I, I do understand why not everybody feels that motivation and that obligation. But I, but in the, in terms of the, the science communication work that I do and things like that, I'm, I'm, I'm always trying to get that message out to as many people as possible mm-hmm. so that the people who are out there who might care but just don't or aren't always aware of the issues and, and what's going on, um, you know, you can get them on, on board a little bit more as well. Ah, that's, it's good insight. And that's, you know, again, why it's fun to talk to scientists because, you know, we, we have so many different perspectives and we always, you know, uh, Angie and I always talk about debate and science is good and it's healthy and we need to come together and debate these issues and say, okay, you know, where, where, where's the middle ground? We have to find some resolution for all these things. So yeah, that's really good. That's yeah, really good. Yeah. That's, that's what science is. It's yeah. a big giant discussion where people <laughs> present new ideas and new things that, that move the, that move the subject forward. Yeah, and you have to have really thick skin. <laughs> really thick yeah, you do. Skin. Yeah. You won't <laughs> yeah, you survive. Do. It's not for the faint hearted. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, you know, I, I guess one of the, the final questions is how do we convince others that your work's important, you know, just in these birds? And worth the, the um, money, I guess. So, I mean, I, for me, the most important thing is is kind of raising awareness, especially for some of the species I work with that that people haven't even heard of. And, and I'm not just talking about outside of New Zealand. The hee hee is a really good example of a bird that a lot of New Zealanders are not familiar with. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is that they exist in really low numbers. They're only on seven sites in the North Island. Some of those sites you can't get to. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them you can, like there are hee hee and mangotaltri near you guys. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're, they're really difficult to see. So most people have never seen a hee hee. They don't understand what they are, or what they do, or why they might be in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, and so 
from that perspective, for me, it's just really important to to get people more aware of, of what those species are, why they're why they're so cool, mm-hmm. and what kind of challenges they're facing, and, and how people can help. So we we did something recently called the Great Hee Hee Sperm Race, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which was a big fundraising and awareness raising initiative, where we actually used my data on swimming speed from from Hee Hee, yeah. and we created a website where we got people to bet on which of the 128 <laughs> males I'd sampled would have the fastest sperm. That's awesome. And it was $10 a bet, and <laughs> all the money went to Hee Hee Conservation. And we ended up getting press coverage for this um, internationally, and we had bets coming in from like 17 different countries around the world. Oh, that's awesome. So for me, the biggest success of that was the fact that people were talking about Hee Hee and, and starting to understand more about what they were, and it gave us a platform to, to talk to people about this bird and, and the unique conservation challenges that it faces and why he he is so expensive to conserve and why that funding is needed. Mm-hmm. But the fact that they don't, they're not a Kiwi, they're not a cockapoo, they don't attract that, that big, big sponsorship and funding. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a really important exercise for me, I, I thought, because that's, that's one of the big challenges we have in conservation is just, just getting people more aware of, of, of what's happening with these different species. Oh, that's, uh, that's amazing. I have like this huge grin on my face. Listen to that. That is, <laughs> that is awesome. And I was going to, I, it crossed my mind when you were talking earlier about your work. I don't know. And, and I haven't really talked about this on the podcast, but have you ever seen the, I'm sure you probably have the BBC that was the great sperm race. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So I will make sure I tell our listeners to watch that. I like every repro class I taught, I made my students watch it. I'm like, if you want to see what sperm have to go through to get fertilized, you know, make it up to the, uh, the egg or the ovum, this, you got to watch this video or watch, and it's on online. So anybody mm-hmm. can watch the great sperm race. So that's amazing that you did that. That is awesome. That is awesome. So I guess final question is how can our listeners help or how could we support you in your efforts or anything we want to do to support the Kiwi? So, I mean, in, in New Zealand, there's many ways to get involved in conservation. Obviously, the, the simplest thing anyone can always do is, is donate. Um, the Kiwis for Kiwi has all different kinds of way that you can contribute to, to he- Kiwi conservation financially. Mm-hmm. Um, and big companies that are listening, like conservation projects are always looking for big long-term sponsorship that's especially true for things like he he where they they really need a a guaranteed source of income year on year but we also appreciate that not everyone is always able to contribute financially and in new zealand it's wonderful because there's so many opportunities to get involved as a volunteer Mm -hmm. Um, there are so many community organizations sanctuaries are often run um, largely off volunteer effort so if you just want to you know donate some of your time whether it's Something as simple as, as pulling up weeds in a, in a conservation area or setting some traps or something more intensive like getting involved in a monitoring program. You know, most of the people who helped me track Kiwi during my PhD were volunteers. Um, and I could not have done that research without them. And mm-hmm. the volunteer ethic in New Zealand is amazing. So if, if people really want to have an impact on conservation in their backyard in New Zealand, then there's just so many opportunities for that with projects who are desperate for people just to give their time more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's great. That's great. Well, for our listeners, you know, I'm going to obviously put uh, Dr. Taylor's website on the link. It's it's HelenTaylorScience.Weebly.com. So I'll make sure to have that link. You can follow her on Twitter at HelenTaylorCG. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, I'll put all these links up. Uh, any other social media or anything that you're... Um, I contribute blogs occasionally to the SciBlogs platform in New Zealand. So if you want to read my thoughts on things like de-extinction and gene editing, that's the main place I, I write about that kind of stuff. So that's that's another good one to look at. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll make sure we, uh, we post that on the show notes. But Dr. Taylor, thank you. Like, I... Wow, this was really great. And I appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk to us. No worries. Thank you very much for having me.